This beautiful, this beautiful summer Sunday is shrouded with mystery and awe, tragedy and disaster. Breaking into this is the holy light of Christ. Let us light our Christ candle as a reminder that even in explicable times and circumstances, Christ's light illumines our paths. We also light the peace candle from the Christ candle, the peace of the world. Good morning. Welcome to St. John's United Church on this glorious Canada Day Sunday. And visitors are welcome to sign our guest book at the number six. Also, welcome to join our fellowship in Shelton Hall after this gathering. I'm going to uh, stand here through the summer with the teaching authority. So when I preach during the regular time, I stand behind the pulpit. But I'm going to stand here the, through the summer. If you don't see me fully because of my height, please come close. <laughs> no complaint, please. Is there any announcement? If not, I invite you to turn around, to pass the peace of Christ to one another, saying, peace be with you. Or you can say, happy Canada Day. <laughs> Please stand to sing our national anthem. <laughs> Canada Day. On this 157th Canada Day, God invites us into the complexities of relationships. Come to sing, to pray, to listen, to dance, and to deepen the journey of faith. Come together in prayer. Loving God, we long to follow in Jesus' footsteps, joining the paths of self-giving and ever-growing wisdom, seeking out reconciliation and a right relationship with the First Nations. Lead us by the power of the your spirit, that together, each supporting one another, we may follow. Amen. Now opening hymn from Voices United, hymn number 374, Come and Find the Choir Center.
did it. Join me in the prayer of the week. Responsibly, precious Lord God of creation, welcome to our morning. It is your morning, really, you made it and you made us. Receive our prayers as we turn to you, seeking time, quality time with you. Break through our resistance with your Holy Spirit. As we open ourselves in this time of reflection and praise, we remember the people who are hurting in our world. Together, Holy One, mingle our spirit with yours so our world may recognize your love in us and through us as we meet in your name in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 to 40. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invite me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty, give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. If you have more voices near you, please pick up voices on the screen, but page 920, the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed is in our hymn book. That means it is our official, one of official creed with two other creeds, the Apostles' Creed and a new creed. If you turn to page 918, there's the Apostles' Creed. At the bottom, you can find a new creed. And page 920, you will see the Nicene Creed. It's quite a long creed, but I like to read the whole with you this morning. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from the light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnated of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered death, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Summer Bible series, the seventh, is back. We know there are four Gospels in the New Testament. The Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There were, however, more than a hundred Gospels in the early Christian era, which were condemned by heretics by the church in the fourth century. Most of them were destroyed, and some were hidden and recently found in a cave by a boy shepherd near Nek Hammadi in Egypt in 1945. And this book is the collection of the documents found in Nek Hammadi. Some of the Gospels in this book are the Gospel of Truth, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Mary, Gospel of Philip, Gospel of Peter, the, second, the Gospel of the Second Coming of Jesus, and the Gospel of the Secret Gospel of John. Are you familiar with any Gospels other than four Gospels in the New Testament? Out of many Gospels, this this summer, I like to read the Gospel of Thomas, which is found in this book, page 117 to 130. With the book, Beyond Belief, written by Elaine Pagel, in 2003 for seven Sundays. That's the project I have with you for this summer. So if you come to the whole summer with me, you have a chance to read the book and the Gospel of Thomas with me. And just come and sit and relax. I'm not asking. I'm not asking you to come forward to read the scripture and nothing. Just relax and, and it's, it's good time to have conversation and to have some ideas to share with each other. Before Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire in 380 CE, before Constantine granted Christianity legal status in 313 CE, Common Era, or even before the Nicene Creed was written in 325 CE, and officially authorized in 381. For nearly 300 years, diverse Christian groups existed. The real, one of the reasons that I pick up the Nicene Creed 
to read together with you is this, because the Nicene Creed is the pivotal one in the Christian history. Right after Constantine offered some kind of freedom for Christianity in 313, the first ecumenical church leadership was called in 325 in Nicene, the city of Nicene. And they formulated the Nicene Creed. Right after, the year after, Christianity became the state religion of the Roman Empire. Okay? It became the state religion. It's not a religion, but the state religion. The Ecumenical Church Council was called again the year after, in, in 381. They authorized the Nicene Creed. What does that mean? This is our official belief. If you agree with it, you are with us. If you're not, you can be excommunicated. That's the Nicene Creed. But through the church history or we traditionally, we, we stood together and read the Apostles' Creed before the United Church's new creed. Am I right? That was created in, uh, in the early, the second century. You, I think some of you read the Nicene Creed for the first time. No? So you're familiar with Nicene Creed? Okay. So that's the history, the background history. But before the Nicene Creed, formulated and authorized, there are so many different types of beliefs within the Christianity. And they welcome newcomers in various ways. And how serious sincere, dedicated, and faithful to Christ is beyond our imagination. So this is preamble before we enter the book of the Gospel of Thomas. Let me highlight some of them using this book, page 1 to 29. Tertullian a Christian spokesman of the second century writes that unlike members of other clubs and societies that collected dues and fees to pay for feasts, members of the Christian family contributed money voluntarily to a common fund to support orphans abandoned in the streets and garbage dumps Christian groups also brought food, medicines, and companionship to prisoners forced to work in mines, banished to prison islands, or held in jail. Some Christians even bought coffins and dug graves to bury the poor and criminals whose corpses otherwise would lie unburied beyond the city walls. So you can see the picture of the second century. There is no buying or selling of any kind in what belongs to God in the Christian family, in the, in the church, in other words. No buying or selling. If we apply this, you know, this principle directly to St. John's United Church, we have to offer pancake breakfast free <laughs> to anyone in the community. They did in the second century. 
Such generosity, which ordinarily could be expected only from one's own family, attracted crowds of newcomers to Christian groups despite the risks. When there was a plague in towns and cities throughout the Roman Empire, doctors could not, of course, treat the disease, and they fled the deadly virus. But some Christians were convinced that God's power was with them to heal or alleviate suffering. They shocked their pagan neighbors by staying to care for the sick and dying, believing that if they themselves should die, they had the power to overcome death. But outsiders condemned and ridiculed Christian Christians because they called each other brother and sister during through the ritual of a baptism. Okay, in the second, third century, the ritual of baptism was condemned. This is one example. During the summer of 202 CE, common era, in an African city, Carthage, where a 22-year-old aristocrat named Vibia Perpetua recently married and the mother of an infant son resolved to undergo baptism along with four other young people at least two of them slaves. When the magistrate asked whether she was a Christian, she said she was. She was immediately arrested, imprisoned, and sentenced to be torn apart by beasts in the public arena. A death sentence of ordinarily reserved for slaves, along with her fellow converts. Her father visited her in prison to persuade her. Daughter, he said, have pity on me, your father, if I deserve to be called your father. If I have loved you more than all your brothers, do not abandon me to people's scorn. Think of your child, who will not be able to live without you. Give up your pride. You will destroy all of us. None of us will ever be able to speak freely again if anything happens to you. Quote, unquote. Because this noble lady wrote a diary. So his father continued to visit him, visit her to persuade. But Perpetua believed that she now belonged to God's family and maintained her detachment. On the birth of Emperor Geta, she walked calmly from prison into the amphitheater as one beloved God, putting down everyone's stare by her own intense gaze to die with her new relatives, who included her slave Felicitas as her sister, Robo and Robocatus also a slave as her brother. No miracle, all died, or all were killed. I just remind you of the background of this background 
Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Gentiles, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. It's not just the word of God. It's not just a teaching from Jesus or from Paul. For them, they practiced it. Justin Martyr called the philosopher, baptized in Rome around the year 140, says, every initiate for baptism who has been convinced and agreed to our teaching would pledge to live as a person transformed. Having changed his or her mind about the past, the candidate could undergo the baptismal bath that cleanses away its pollution before his or her baptism. The initiate, often shivering beside the river, undressed and went under water to emerge wet and naked, born again. That's the second century baptism by the river. Is there anyone in our congregation was baptized by the river? I, I remember one lady in, in New Brunswick, my previous you know, pastoral charge, who was 95 years old. She, was, she told me her baptism to be held by the St. John's River in New Brunswick. It's cold, it's a, it's a, she said it's a Easter Sunday, which is early uh, April in New Brunswick. So shivering, right? <laughs> Just as any Roman newborn would first be presented to the Father to accept or reject. Interesting, yeah? The newborn child can be accepted or rejected by his or her father. Before it could be embraced as a member of the family, the newly baptized would be presented before God, the Father of all. Now the initiate, no longer called as before by his or her paternal, paternal name, would hear the initiator pronouncing the name of the Father of all, of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Then clothed in new garments, the newborn Christian would be fed a mixture of milk and honey. That's the process of baptism, the ritual baptism. To be baptized by the, in, in, the, in the water by the river, and they ate the, the mixture of what? Milk and honey. What's the milk stand for? God's blessing, God's protection and care. That's the symbol of milk. What about honey? The symbol of immortality of your soul. They ate it. The food of members, so, the newborn Christian would be fed a mixture of milk and honey. The food of members of the assembled community would invite the newcomer to share. No, no, okay. I, I miss. The food of newborn infants and be brought in to greet those we call brothers and sisters with a kiss. We follow, we have, still have some tradition. At the beginning of our gathering, 
we have time of sharing peace, right? Before COVID-19, we shook hands or hugging each other. But after COVID, we still stay away and waving each other, right? But the original sharing of peace with kids. They are brothers and sisters, not strangers anymore. That's the distinctive sign. You are now one of our families. Welcome. Would you like to go back to this tradition? A little too much? But that's the Christianity in the second century. After that kissing, the members of the assembled community would invite the newcomer to share bread and wine in the Eucharist. Eucharist literally means thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for the spiritual food, the sacred Christian family meal. That's the whole process of ritual in the second century, the ritual of baptism. The Didache, Greek for teaching, which was written in Syria about 10 years before the New Testament Gospels of Matthew and Luke, opens with a succinct summary of God's law. The way of life is this. First, you shall love God who made you and love your neighbor as yourself. And whatever you do not want to have done to you, do not do to another. That's the key message of Didache, which is also we, we, can find, we, can, we can find in the Gospel of Matthew. You shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not have sexual intercourse with, you shall not murder. It's very interesting, it's very, quite detailed. You shall not murder the child in the womb, nor kill newborns. You shall not turn away the destitute. Didache teaches not to follow the way of death and urges his hearers to be perfect. To be perfect. Being perfect suggests bearing the whole yoke of the Lord. That is, obeying the whole divine law in the Bible. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 48, Jesus says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Justin Martyr says, We baptize those who not only accept Jesus' teaching, but undertake to be able to live accordingly. They practiced what they were taught and believed. Interesting. The next is Offering invitation, God has shown us the meaning of generosity in the beautiful diversity of creation, the overflowing love of Jesus Christ, and the never-ending gift of Holy Spirit. God has abundantly blessed us and called us to be a community that blesses others through the sharing of our love, our talents, and our material possessions. Let us rejoice now in what we have been given and in what is ours.
to offer as we receive our morning offerings. The ushers are coming forward for offering to God. Offertory prayer. Please join me in this prayer together. Give our life. Today we dedicate this offering to your works throughout the world. May it find the places desperately in need of love. May it be a beacon of hope for all. Amen. Closing hymn from Voices United 581, When We Are Living.
God loves you, God provides for you, God in three persons knows you. May the love of our Creator, the Holy Spirit, and the risen Christ be with you now, all we, and in all ways. Go in peace, faith, and love. Amen. Please be seated.